hand. And so you people are here to, to, uh, to be entertained and uh, here's some historical facts about uh, some of the earliest phonographs and uh, records uh, of the recorded sound variety that were in existence between 1900 and 1925. And of course, it all started uh, in 1877 down in the uh, West Orange, New Jersey laboratories of uh, Edison, Thomas Alva Edison, the Wizard of Menlo Park who uh, was responsible for over a thousand patents in his lifetime. But of those patents, his favorite invention was the phonograph. And so I'll gradually take you from the, from the invention of the phonograph in 1877, right on through to the demise of Edison's phonograph output and production in uh, 1929. And we'll cover the gamut from, of uh, recorded sound from 1904 up to 1928 on various Edison phonographs that were produced in that time period. And of course, it all started in December of 1877 when um, Edison called one of his um, engineers at his lab forward and said, here's this design, Mr. Crucy. I want you to take this design and model it the way of, I have designed it because I feel that this, phone, this little invention that I'm going to call a phonograph is going to be able to take my voice, record it, and then play it back for the first time in the history of the world. And that's what happened. And of course, there are photographers there, and this is a, uh, an actual drawing of what Edison looked like. And he pressed his mouth up to that uh, little recording horn and recited the words. Does anybody know what he recited? Yeah, I think it is Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, that's right. And then he played it back, much to the amazement of everyone who was uh, in the room that day. And uh, there's an actual picture of the machine um, that's down at the Edison Historic Site uh, in West Orange, New Jersey, if you ever get that. That's what it looked like. Very crude. It was all, he turned it by hand, had no motor at all. And basically, it, uh, basically the stylus cut grooves into a piece of tin, foil, of tin foil and lead that were wrapped around that mandrel there. You can see the, actually see the grooves in it. So in 1878, Edison patented the phonograph and then he went to Congress to display his, uh, a larger version of his invention, the phonograph, before Congress and then President Rutherford B. Hayes. But the Edison uh, phonograph at that point obviously wasn't ready for prime time. It had to be developed and mass produced and improved upon. And here's a photo of Edison after he and his staff worked for 48 straight hours to develop a better phonograph that can, would compete to the, with the Bell Interest who had co-opted Edison's idea um, and produced their own graphophone, which actually was a um, improvement over the tinfoil and operated on wax. So here's Edison uh, with his, the Edison new phonograph. And it wasn't long before Edison was dominating the first home entertainment phonograph field. But that, that, um, that, took, that actually took another 10 years for Edison to develop um, a mainspring mechanism that would keep the phonograph turning at about 120 to 160 revolutions per minute to play Edison cylinders. And uh, it wasn't long before he was using one of his rooms in his laboratories to produce the first records. And the first recording stars went to his studio and started producing those records. And here's a gentleman with a novel idea on how to sell Edison phonograph records going down the street in a horse and buggy. This is an actual phonograph from that time period. Probably taken around the late 1890s, early 1900s. And there's the uh, busy uh, Edison workshop there. And these fellows are producing the cylinders that have been recorded on wax masters up in the recording room up on the second floor of the Edison Laboratories at Menlo Park in West, West Orange, New Jersey. And here's an old uh, advertising lithograph, and there's old Myron Pa there 
and it looks like they brought home an Edison standard, and they're having a ball listening to some of the first uh, recorded sound cylinders. Those that look like two-minute black wax cylinders, which means this is probably from around 1902. Now, that brings us up to our first recorded sound segment. And in the early days of recorded sound, ragtime was extremely popular. And, uh, and some of the great artists of the day, like Scott Joplin, uh, uh, he, he, never, he made a, never made a record, but of course he was responsible for the composition of the Maple Leaf Rag in 1898, which probably started uh, the bonanza of other composers recording ragtime music. And of course Irving Berlin even got into the act around 1910 and recorded the International Rag. But our first recorded selection, and it's our only instru uh, sole instrumental, is going to be the uh, St. Louis Rag, which was composed by Tom Turpin in 1904. And in 1904, they had the St. Louis Exposition. And some of the great songs that were played at the St. Louis Exposition, can anybody name one of them? Uh, there was Under the anheuser Bush, and there was another one called... Meet Me in St. Louis? Meet me in St. Louis, Louis. And other than that, they were playing Tom Trippin's um, St. Louis Rag at the St. Louis World's Fair. So I'm going to keep that to you now. And uh, people think of ragtime music in the early days. They usually, they usually, it's usually synonymous with the piano, but the piano recorded very poorly, utilizing the early acoustic, uh, acoustic method of recorded sound where the instrument actually had to play into a recording horn. So when you hear ragtime music in the early days of recorded sound, it's usually played on the banjo. And what better artist to be featured here than the banjo king himself, a fellow by the name of uh, Vessel Osman, who is going to be playing the St. Louis rag on the original 1904 version of, done on two-minute black wax cylinder. So let me give that to you now. And I'm going to play this on a, a 1909 original Edison fireside phonograph with a signet horn.
Okay, that's a pretty remarkable volume for a record that's like a hundred and, um, let's see, 1904, that would be 115, almost 114 years old today, or last week, or whenever. But <laughs> pretty, pretty amazing. Um, you can imagine the amount of uh, cylinders from that era that are still around going back to 1904. Uh, most of them, uh, when electrically recorded sound came in and disc phonograph records came in, were basically either thrown out or stored up in somebody's attic or down in the basement, uh, where they were subjected to mold and mildew and heat and cold, which basically uh, destroyed many of them. Uh, so only a, a very small percentage of the output of Edison cylinders that were produced back in, um, in way back when, are uh, still in existence, and I'm, I'm happy to have uh, I'm happy to have quite a few of them. Okay, uh, Broadway musicals were extremely popular uh, back in the early days of uh, recorded sound, and so I'm going to take you to 1905. Uh, can anybody does anybody recognize who these individuals are? This is the Cohan family. Um, George M. Cohan is over there, way on the right. You can hardly see him. And his sister and his mother and his father, Jerry, who was, was really the promoter of the group. And uh, everybody remembers who George M. Cohan was. He was, he was responsible for some uh, great, great compositions like Over There During World War I and um, You're a Grand Old Flag. And uh, he wrote this wrote this great musical back in 1904 called Little Johnny Jones, and it appeared on Broadway. And from that musical came two great uh, selections. One was um, Give My Regards to Broadway, and the other one was Yankee Doodle Dandy. Now, unfortunately, George M. Cohan didn't record any of his great well-known songs on record. But the fellow who was responsible for recording most of them was Mr. Billy Murray who probably ranks second among record sales in the 78 RPM era, uh, next to Bing Crosby, who came quite a bit later. But uh, Billy Murray was here, there, and everywhere recording for Edison, Victor, and Columbia, and many, many other record companies. So I'm going to feature the original record, 1905 recording of Give My Regards to Broadway, uh, featuring Billy Murray at, uh, at this time. And as I move through here, you'll not only see some photos of Billy, but you'll see pictures of the Cohan family as they look performing on Broadway. Give my regards to Broadway, sung by Billy Murray at a Sun Records. <laughs>
Okay, is everyone enjoying the program so far? Okay. Um, so as you can see, I'm not just here to play records because that would be pretty boring, but I'm trying to give you some visuals as well. So I've tried to combine visuals along with the records and uh, I think it makes it a little more entertaining than just having a record collector come up here and play records. So we'll move on to the next. Oh, does everybody see that okay? Because I can hardly see it. This is Edison sleeping on a workbench down in West Orange, New Jersey. Somebody obviously from the uh, staff captured this phonograph. Edison didn't exercise much at all, and uh, he was a workaholic, so when he was busy on a project in his next invention, he would work until he was almost exhausted and then uh, clear, a, clear a workbench someplace and jump up there and sleep for seven or eight hours and then wake up and continue his project. So I thought that was kind of an interesting photo to include in the presentation today. Okay, now I'm going to take you to the ball game, uh, to the great American pastime. And I'm getting, going to give you the first uh, recorded version on two-minute black wax cylinder of uh, this great classic, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which became the theme song of our national pastime. Words by Jack Norworth and uh, music by Albert von Tilter. Interesting to note uh, the history of this particular song. Neither Norworth nor von Tilter had ever been to a ball game when they wrote this song. And the thing that's interesting about this, this, uh, this song, if you've never heard it, uh, played all the way through is that it actually has two verses to it. It's all about uh, a lady named, a young lady named Katie Casey, who was baseball mad. She had the fever and had it bad, just to root for the hometown crew. Every sou, that's like uh, dollars and cents, Katie Blue. On one Saturday, her young beau called to see if she'd like to go to see a show, but Miss Kate said no. I'll tell you what you can do. Take me out to the ball game. So if you want to, if the crowd wants to sing the chorus, they can, and we'll let um, Ed Meeker uh, sing that. And then Ed Meeker was not only a performer on Edison, but the introductions you hear at the boast of his two-minute cylinders um, introducing artists, he also handled that duties down at the Edison Studios as well. So here's the original two-minute black wax cylinder of Edward Meeker singing Take Me Out to the Ball Game from 1908. And um, I'm going to do this on the first little compact phonograph that Edison ever created. Most of the Edison phonographs are nice, rounded, and look really nice. This particular machine is from 1898, and it's the only square box machine that he ever made. This is the original standard model A. And this particular version is from right around 1899, and it's still going strong. Also interesting about this machine is that it started off as a two-minute machine, but in 1908, Edison came out with four-minute black wax cylinders that would play for four minutes. And they offered this little conversion kit, and this has the conversion kit, so it's able to play both two-minute and four-minute Edison cylinders. So let me put that on for you now, the original version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game. Yeah. 
Okay, there you have it, the first recorded um, version of Take Me Out to the Ball Game on Edison two-minute black wax cylinder from the year 1908. All right, now I'm going to move down. This is the first lady we're going to hear from, and she was almost considered the first lady of recorded sound. That's Miss Ada Jones sitting in the middle, and she's uh, surrounded by the Edison Premier Quartet. And that's Billy Murray uh, with his head leaning against the right shoulder. It's a great photograph, but um, unfortunately it's a little too light to see it. But um, what we're going to do now, does everybody have this, their songs that I left uh, on, the ch on the chair? Okay. This is a version of a great song that was recorded by Ada Jones and the Premier Quartet in um, 19... 1912, and by 1912, of course, Edison was producing uh, two-minute cylinders, and he wasn't producing them on wax, but he was producing on producing them on celluloid, which was basically unbreakable. So it was it held up certainly a lot better than uh, the black wax cylinders, which you could drop on the floor and they would shatter into a hundred or two hundred pieces. So. I'm going to feature an Edison uh, four-minute uh, blue amber all cylinder by the light of the silvery moon. Does everybody know? Uh, but everyone know that song? It's so, a wonderful life. What's that? It's their song from "It's a Wonderful Life." Donna, yeah. Donna Reed and uh, Jimmy Stewart. Oh yes, I remember them singing that. Yeah, when he last sows the moon, right? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, we're going to let Ada Jones sing the, ver the verses. In the first chorus, I want the ladies to join in and sing. And then she's going to sing another verse, and then I want the gentlemen to join in and sing. And then she sings the last verse, and then everybody can join in and sing that. But somebody has to lead it. William, would you like to lead the, uh, lead the parade here and join in and sing that? OK. All right. So let me put that on for you. What I'm going to play this on is um, an Edison Amberola 5, which was the first Edison table model interior horn phonograph that he created to compete with the Victor Victrola. The Victor Victrola came out, it was a brainchild of Eldridge Johnson of the Victor Talking Machine Company. He was the first one to take the ungangly horn and move it into a piece of furniture and call it the Victrola. So, of course, Edison was a stubborn old guy, and he says, no, we'll just keep the horns. But Victor started to greatly outpace the output of the Victor Talking Machine Company. So Edison was forced to take his horn and move it in to a, 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 an attractive piece of furniture and call it an, amber, an Amberola. It was the days of the Ola. Victor started it with the Victrola, which was... Um, followed very closely by Columbia with their Graffinola, and then Edison with his Amberola. So Ola, it was a, they went Ola crazy back then. There's a jukebox named Rockola. Too. And then there was a Rockola, but it all started with the Victrola, and Eldridge Johnson of the Victor Talking Machine Company. And the, yes, yes, and if you, took, if you took money for promoting records back in the 50s, you were guilty of payola. Right. I remember that. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let's, let's do that for you. It was also the, the only table model with a stop. And what you did was line this up with the end of the...
Okay, you ready, ladies? Don't let me down. By the light of the silvery moon, I want to spoon to my honey I'll The silvery moon, I want to spoon, for my honey and cool love's tune, honeymoon, it was shining in June, your silvery beams will bring love's dreams, we'll be cuddling soon, by the silvery moon. stop with. <laughs> Miss Ada Jones, back by the Edison Premier Quartet and by the light of the silvery moon from 1912. Okay. All right. Um, a few years ago, how many years ago was that, Margie? We went down to the Edison historic site. Probably seven or eight, maybe? Uh, anybody ever been there? Edison Historic Site? Yeah. A fantastic take. Uh, and there's two things you can do. You can either take the guided tour, it's all done by the National Park Service, um, or you can do a uh, self-guided tour. And we did the self-guided tour with a headset, and they told us where to go, and once we got there, they told us what we were looking at. It's fascinating. Uh, so there it is, down in West Orange, New Jersey, right off Route 95. Uh, there I am outside of the uh, Edison Laboratories. And uh, this is the massive machine shop. I think that was down on the first floor, if I'm not mistaken, where all of the uh, uh, mechanical tools were made. 
Uh, and there's the library, and down on the first floor is, uh, is Edison's office, and there's Edison's desk. And uh, what's that sitting right on the center of the desk there is a, is a reproducer uh, for the mach next machine I'm going to be showing you, uh, sitting right in the middle of Edison's desk. There's Edison's recording studio, and there's the old man in the middle paying a visit to the recording studio. That's up, I believe that's up on the second floor of the uh, Edison's uh, laboratories. And there I am, probably about uh, uh, 90 years later, uh, pointing into Edison's, Edison's music room, where most of the recordings were made. Then right down the street, you can visit Edison's estate at Glenmont. Uh, it's a fascinating visit uh, as well, as you can see where Edison um, called his thought factory, where most of his inventions were con conjured up in his head. And there's Glenmont, which is right down the street, also part of the National Park Service, and they conduct the tours there as well. Okay. We're taking you back to the early days of motoring, when you'd have to get under, get out and get under, and fix up your automobile. This is from 1914, uh, and uh, this, again, is going to feature uh, Mr. Billy Murray, who's going to be the lead vocalist in this. And of course, back in the early days of motoring, of driving a Model T around, or an Oldsmobile, or whatever you had, there were very few service stations back then, so you almost had to be your own mechanic. And if your car broke down there, you needed to be skilled in the basics of getting that car running again so you could get back home. And this is all about a, this is all about a fellow named by the name of Johnny O'Connor, who invites his best girl out for a drive, but he can't get the first base with her because every time he tries, the car breaks down and he has to get under, get out and get under and fix up his automobile. So, very interesting song, very humorous song, or what they call a uh, comedy or novelty number. So let me give that for you, for you now. I just have to change the uh, four minute blue amber all cylinder. Give it a few cranks. Just dying to cuddle his 
great song from 1914, he'd have to get under, get out and get under, and fix up his automobile. Um, they don't make songs like that anymore, do they? Most of the songs now, you can't even understand the lyrics. But um, that's what Tin, Tin Pan Alley was pumping out back then. It was the, the days of the comedy novelty numbers. Uh, and Tin Pan Alley was pumping out great songs like that. Okay. So... I'm going to get into Epson diamond discs now. In order to play a diamond disc, I certainly can't play it on a, 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 a cylinder player. I have to play it on a diamond disc machine. And this is a very special diamond disc machine that deserves an unveiling. That's why, it, that's why it's been under here. So I've been trying to keep this pretty exclusive to, to what's under here. But let me introduce it. Okay. This was the Edison Army-Navy diamond disc phonograph produced from July 1917 to November of 1918, produced and sold in the true patriotic spirit. It was made by the, with the best grade lumber in strips five inches to eight inches thick, tongue and grooved and bound with a sheet iron around the top and bottom and reinforced at the corners and assembled with screws. The di designed to withstand enemy bombardment enemy bombardment and rough treatment as it was moved from battlefield to battlefield during World War I. It contained an elaborate Corbin locking system to secure the reproducer, tone arm, and turntable for traveling. For service in the field, it came complete with a spare spring and spring barrel, a supply of oil, grease, and graphite. Edison insisted that the machine be sold without profit at a cost of $38.17. It was distributed to church groups and civic organizations who would in turn donate the phonograph to local army and navy units going to Europe. Production was discontinued after the armistice in November of 1918. Diamond Point's Edison newsletter of March 1919 said, quote, when all the Edison army navy models that have survived the war get back to this country, someone will have to write a book about them. So are you ready? Are you ready for the unveiling? Oh my goodness. Has anyone ever seen a machine like that? And on the top it says, the new Edison diamond disc phonograph, Army and Navy model. They came in Army drab and Navy blue. No one in this day and age has ever seen the navy blue one. If you ever find one, let me know. But as collectors today have never seen one in navy blue. But this one obviously is an army draft. Who's this that? What's that? Who's this that? Who's this Who owns it now? I do. It's mine. Yes. A fellow by the name of Robert English from Marshfield um, knew that I was into collectibles and collecting phonographs, and he was nice enough to sell me this machine probably about 10 or 12 years ago, I think, or maybe longer. Uh, I had never seen one until I went over to his van and was looking through all the things that he collected, 
and he had an Army Navy machine, and he, he found it at a, a church, um, I believe either in Jamaica Plain or uh, some part of Boston. And that sounds right because it went over, was donated by the church, went over to World War I, and then came back, and uh, the church had it. And they were selling it at a yard sale, at a clearance. So he ended up with it. And then I ended up with it. And here it is. Why is it called Uh These reproducers on these Edison machines um, had a permanent diamond stylus that never wore out. That was the one advantage that Edison had over Victor and Columbia. All of his records, including his diamond disc records, were made utilizing the vertical groove method of recording sound, of recorded sound, which means that the, the sound is at the bottom of the groove, rather than on the sides of the groove, utilizing the uh, lateral groove process, which was done by Victor and Columbia. Those machines had a changeable needle system, and you had to change the needle, the steel needle, after every other play. Edison, Edison, um, beat them on that one, but uh, he was backward in a lot of ways, uh, which I've already get into, and uh, that's why his uh, record company failed in, uh, just before the Depression in 1929. Okay, so I had to bring this so I could play some diamond discs for you, and I, and I thought that was a great story about the Army, Edison Army Navy machine, because this weighs about 150 pounds, but who's the fellow back? And I've never seen this done before, but that gentleman back there, uh, he actually took it out of my van, bench pressed it up over his head, <laughs> and then proceeded to carry it in unassisted. And of course, it has these heavy duty handles on each side, so it could be lugged through the battlefields of Europe. But if they had him over there, then he could have been just assigned to carry that machine around, and they would have thanked him for it. Okay, so I'm going to feature four diamond discs before we get to the close of the program. And uh, this Edison, who in um, 1911 basically decided that he had to do something in order to compete with Victor in Columbia, who's, uh, who uh, at that particular point in time were, were dominating the home entertainment phonograph field. So he produced his Edison diamond disc machine, a quarter, a quarter inch thick records uh, that played for three and a half to four, four minutes and were played on the Edison Diamond Disc phonographs. And there's one of Edison Diamond Disc phonographs. That looks like the one that's up on the second floor of Glenmont, and there he is listening to that phonograph. And they were, they were gorgeous phonographs, very, very nicely, nicely, uh, nicely done, had beautiful features. This was a stand-up A250 that I used to own. Uh, well, actually, it was my first Edison phonograph and the first Edison stand-up diamond disc, the A250 machine. But this is a song all about uh, Bonnie Google and his horse, Spark Plug. Who, uh, do you remember Bonnie Google? This was one of the great song hits, believe it or not, of 1923. Bonnie Google was amazing. He could do almost anything. It could blow out a major fire just by blowing at it. And uh, the ladies loved Bonnie Google, and he was always trying to get his horse into a horse race. But Spark Plug always ran the other way, unfortunately. And uh, he was a comic strip carrier character, and he actually introduced in the in the Bonnie Google comic strip was a fellow by the name of Snuffy Smith, kind of a hillbilly. And he carried on the Barney Google comic strip column up until the was 1960s or 70s, and then I think it went out of went out of existence. Do you remember the Snuffy Smith? Barney used to visit him occasionally. But this song is all about Barney Google with the Google googly eyes, and uh, this is from 1923. And this is going to feature the interwoven pair of. Billy Jones and Ernie Heer, who were a duet and radio personalities who were extremely popular in the 1920s and early 30s. Oh, 
I don't know what politician you have reference to. Well, it is a Mr. Bryan. Then it must be Mr. Hugh. I've got a hunch and two this bunch I'm going to introduce. Who's that? Marley Google with a Google 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 from 1923 with his googly googly eyes. When St. Peter saw his face, he said, go to the other place. <laughs> okay. Is that 78 RPM? This is, this is 80 RPM. 80 RPM. Yeah, let's pass that around so everyone can see that. Okay. Unless you had a propaganda record you wanted I was to put on. If there were such propaganda yeah, there were actually propaganda records. It was skipping because unless these diamond disc reproducers are centered, if they fall out of center, they will uh, they will basically skip. That's why you saw me watching that because it was out of center and I pushed it back in center. So. All of the records you've, you've heard so far were, uh, it's too bad you can't see this, because this shows what an, an acoustic recording studio actually looks like, but you can, I think you can see the horn there on the left hand side of the screen, and crammed in front of that big horn is the Edison Orchestra uh, playing into it, and that's what recording <coughs> looked like. You would play into a large horn, okay, and that large horn would empty the sound into the little recording studio that was behind there where the stylus cut a groove into a wax master. 
and then that wax mass that could be duplicated uh, to make diamond diamond discs. So that was the very crude and archaic method that was first used by Edison from 1877 up till, uh, up till 1927, 28. Victor and Columbia converted to the electrical groove method uh, to, a, to an electric, to, to the electric method that was developed by Western Electric. And in 1925, they bought the patent, patent rights to electrically recorded sound where you sang or uh, played into a microphone. It cut more perfect grooves into the cylinder and you couldn't hear a lot of the background noise that you hear. Uh, and the decibel level of sound went way up and it was much, much, uh, it was a great improvement uh, in electric. What's that? Ribbon microphone? Yeah, pretty much. And, but of course, Edison said electrically recorded sound is never going to work. It'll, 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 there'll be too much distortion. So he refused to buy into it until. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, he refused to buy into the electri electrically recorded sound process because he felt it would, be, it would create too much distortion. Okay? And he seemed to be always late with everything, especially with the phonograph, to update his uh, phonograph division. So he waited till late 1927 to finally buy the patent rights, rights from Western Electric and make electrically recorded sound records, which lasted from 1928 until the demise of his uh, phonograph operation in late 1929. So when you find an electrically recorded Edison diamond discs, it's a find. And I have found a few of them in my time. And so I'm going to feature the last, my last two diamond discs will be electrically recorded sound Edisons, which I will play on this machine. This record was a big hit in, in, 19, in, the, in the mid 1920s, and it's My Blue Heaven. Does everybody remember My Blue Heaven? When whippoorwills call and evening is nigh, I hurry to My Blue Heaven. A turn to the right, a little white light will lead me, lead me to my blue heaven. And this is going to be sung by a lady who was, who, uh, was very prominent, um, was very prominent in the 1920s, a lady by the name of Vaughn DeLeith. And she was one of the first women to sing on uh, early radio programs. In fact, she did one of uh, Lee DeForest's first, first uh, he was the inventor of, the, of modern day radio. And his first, one of his first radio broadcasts in 1920 featured this lady, Vaughn DeLeaf, because she had such a, a great manner of putting across the song and a great voice, singing voice, for uh, early radio and early phonograph records. And uh, there were many artists that did My Blue Heaven, but this is my favorite, because it actually has bird sound effects in it uh, throughout the record. So here is Miss Vaughn Lee singing uh, from 1928 on a rare Edison uh, electric, electrically recorded record, My Blue Heaven. Wow. 
what makes the world go round It's nothing but love When winter will come And evening is love I hurry to my blue heaven I turn to the world A little white love Will lead you If you found that delightful, raise your hand. Yeah. <laughs> Miss Blondelief singing My Blue Heaven, that's from 1928. My last record from the 1920s is um, one of the number one hits from 1928. 1928 was a significant year uh, for movies. And we move into, as we move into the dance record category. Um, and this is a, a rare Edison jazz record as well from the late 1920s. That's the Louisiana Five, but this record is going, not going to be from the, uh, by the Louisiana Five. It's going to be by the California Ramblers. And if you're a record collector, the California Re uh, Ramblers were the foremost group that recorded and was popular on, on almost every, uh, in every recording studio. Victor, Columbia, uh, they recorded for, uh, and they also recorded on Edison as the Golden Gate Orchestra. And they're going to be playing a song called uh, Meredith. What's your favorite song? What's your favorite song? Old time record. Oh, it is. I thought it was. Uh, There's a rainbow around my shoulder. Oh, that's my second favorite. Okay. <laughs> also in, in 1928 was rele Warner Brothers released. Okay, the first all talking recorded. Um, all talking motion picture. Wasn't a jazz singer, that was only partially. That was only a partial talking. But Jolson, a year later, made a, 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 um, a movie called The Singing Fool. And from that record came two great hits, Sonny Boy, which I'm sure most of you know if you know the history of Al Jolson, and There's a Rainbow Around My Shoulder. And those were both sung by Jolson in that particular movie. Of course, Jolson can't sing on Edison because at this particular time, he had signed a long-term agreement with Brunswick in 1924 and was still under contract with Brunswick. But this is the version done by the California Ramblers with a superb vocal, vocal um, chorus by a gentleman by the name of J. Donald Parker. So let me put that on for you now. I'm going to feature some, um, some, uh, some, of, some dance routines because uh, this dance records were extremely popular. And I'm going to show you some dance routines. There'll be some pictures of people dancing in dance marathons, the Charlesons, and things of that nature, uh, just for entertainment purposes. This is the next to the last selection.
much better uh, electrically recorded sound, uh, the improvement that it made off of the old acoustical method, and that's 1928, the California Ramblers, uh, also known as the Golden Gate Orchestra, uh, doing, there's a rainbow around my sh shoulder from 1928. Does anybody know who this couple is? That's Fred, Fred Astaire and his sister uh, Adele, that's from like the late 1920s, and they were starring in musicals. Actually, the one just before that that you couldn't see because of the lighting in here was a picture of Fred and Adele Astaire, ages five and seven, uh, when they were first uh, in vaudeville back in, around like 1902 and 1903. So I had both of those up there, but you couldn't see the first one. Um, so uh, we had a... Um, we had the Great European War during the early days of recorded sound. Uh, as the boys in uniform sailed off to, uh, to fight the war against Germany in far off Europe. And uh, of course, I already read you the history of the Edison diamond disc machine. But shortly after the, after the armistice was signed in uh, late uh, 1918, Edison decided that he wanted to uh, record his voice for the very first time that was made available to the general public. And so he, uh, he wrote a tribute and recorded it, and it's called Let Us Not Forget, in which he pays tribute and homage to uh, the boys in uniform who uh, sacrificed in World War I and also to the gallant allies who backed the United States up, the countries of, of Belgium, France, uh, England, and uh, Belgium, France, and England. I think there might have been one other. But um, he recorded this in 1919, and I'm going to give you uh, that rare selection now. And it was made available to the general public uh, on a record almost like the one that you brought. And on one side is uh, the national ears of the Allies, and on the, f the other side is Edison doing his uh, his tribute to the boys in uniform, let us not forget. So it's only right that the last selection on here is the voice of Thomas Alva Edison. So let me give that to you now. It's very brief. And what you'll first hear is the announcer introducing the Wizard of Menlo Park, Mr. Thomas Alva Edison, and then you'll hear Edison's voice. 
At this particular point in time, Edison was already in his, nine, in his 70s. And as you probably know of the history of Edison, uh, as he got older, he became like partially deaf and it was harder and harder for him to hear. So um, here is the voice of Thomas Alva Edison from 1919 and let us not forget There's the voice of Edison himself, the Wizard of Menlo Park. And let us not forget from 1919. That's our last selection. And so I've covered the gamut. I've, I've taken you basically from uh, Edison's first early all crank hand phonograph that he invented in 1877 up to including the golden, golden age of Edison cylinders in which he he produced all of these great cylinder model machines uh, from, the, from the little Edison gem that only cost about $10 up until the, uh, the very pricey Edison opera that uh, sold for about $200. And if you're ever going down 95 and you want to pay a visit to the, to Edison, the Edison, uh, uh, the Glenmont, Edison's estate, which was part of the uh, National Park Service tour, you can go into the backyard and there is Edison, Edison's uh, grave site, Thomas Alva Edison, 1847 to 1931, and right next to him is, uh, is buried his wife, Mina. So that concludes our program here this afternoon. I'm gonna get you home in plenty of time to see the Patriots, but thank you for attending and I hope you enjoyed the program as much as I enjoyed bringing it to you. Thank you.